Hi there. My name's Eli, and I'm one of the co-hosts of TechSoup Connect Vancouver. This is a local tech for good groups, all under the umbrella of TechSoup. TechSoup is a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits get, implement, and use technology effectively. Today, we're going to be talking about accessible online learning. And to do that, we brought the expert in, Leah Chang from Leah Chang Learning. Leah is a CEO and she's dedicated her last two years of her career to educational leadership. She founded the Leah Chang Learning in 2019, where she and her team have developed curriculum for many sectors on complex on complex topics. As their lead instructional designer, she's adept at distilling large concepts into digestible learning opportunities. And as their lead technologist, she's passionate about supporting organizational development and change through digital adoption and enablement. I'm going to share a little bit about my team and what, where I am. And also, I'd love to know where you are. So my territorial acknowledgement is something I'm just learning about. I moved to Salt Spring Island recently. I'm in the Gulf Islands. And this is shared uh, community space of the Coast Salish peoples and the Halkameem uh, peoples. Yeah, I'm really honored to be a new community member here. And I, I definitely want to make sure that this talk is going to be useful for you and applicable. And I'd love to know if you have any burning questions about accessibility, online learning. I'll try my best to answer them. And I'd love to see lots of questions in the chat. So feel free to add them in anytime. I will pause once in a while. And also, if you have a question and you feel brave, if you want to go on off mute, just put up your hand and Eli can help me make sure we're engaging the community. So don't be shy. Yeah. Okay, great. I see some questions coming in. Awesome. So first of all, I just want to say thank you to TechSoup. Thank you to Eli. Thanks to you folks. I, as a sort of a, a new consultant in the nonprofit and online learning space, bought a lot from TechSoup and the, the local communities and meetups back in the day. And so I just want to commend you for A, joining in, being part of these conversations. So much is out there nowadays in terms of AI and online learning and how do we manage with all this new technology? I think it's really important that we uh, leverage our community and our, our connections. So thanks for all of you for jo joining and, and feel free to share any tips or tricks um, or questions in the chat anytime because that's the whole purpose of this. So please do. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our group. So LCL is an, an online consultancy with many people across uh, Canada. But we provide services such as supporting organizations with their accessibility strategy, uh, in particular, how it relates to online learning. We design learning products. We support uh, organizations with the technology and building tech stacks that make sense for them and how they want to deliver online learning. We design curriculum and we get to work with some amazing partners across the country. So you'll see some pictures here of us supporting accessible employers in British Columbia in various ways. Uh, what I'm going to do today is share a little bit about what we've learned and things that we're curious about, things that we keep growing and evolving in. And of course, we are not perfect in everything. And so it's important for us to keep growing together. And I, I just want to say that we, we love working with the clients that we have and the projects that we've been on. And we're learning so much as we grow with these organizations. So we, we tend to work quite a lot with organizations that support mental health, as well as uh, people on the spectrum, people who are neurodiverse. We do a lot of inclusion in the workplace. And it's been such an exciting ride. We've loved learning and growing with these organizations. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me anytime or connect with me afterwards if you want to know more about what we do. But I'd like to share my team and company's accessibility statement with you. And we're going to come back to this at the end, but at LCL, we are all about removing barriers to online learning. So that's like a pretty broad statement. And we're going to talk a little bit about what online learning is and what those barriers might be. But what that means for us is that we want to design learning that's accessible and optimized for everybody. And so what that means is we apply various different frameworks to make sure that learning experience is optimized. And hopefully you can take some of these away with you and, and take them back to your organization today. But 
Some of the concepts we'll talk about that we include in our accessibility statement are things like universal design. So as I read these out, I, let's just practice this. If, has anyone heard of universal design before? If so, you can just raise your hand and we can see it like that. Or you can use the chat. Awesome. And if you haven't, that's okay. We're going to talk about it today. These are concepts that you could use to embrace in your work. What about preferred language such as person first or identity first language? Are these concepts or terms you've heard before? Great. We'll talk a bit about that. Basically, it's now no longer one size fits all. We use the terms that people prefer and we ask them what they prefer. Some groups prefer to identify as a uh, person first, some prefer identity first. And so we, we just ask. <laughs> we talk a lot about assistive technology and what that is. We support neurodiversity. We try to embrace the neurodiversity and the, the divergence that we may have. And lastly, we embrace allyship. So we work very much with our communities. We don't just work about them and we'll hopefully talk through some of that and, and how it applies to your organization today. So that's our accessibility statement. So what are we going to do in this next time together? We will talk about some sort of frequently asked questions when it comes to accessibility and online learning. We'll use some terms. We're going to talk about some tools and we're going to probably cover a whole bunch of formats and delivery methods. If at any point in time I'm, I'm speaking too fast or you have a question like, hey, what is that? Please let me know and I'd be happy to pause. Um, there's lots of terms when it comes to e-learning or asynchronous or synchronous learning. So there are many different ways to name and to talk about the same thing, the same concepts. I might use a variety of terms today, but we will not be talking about website accessibility from a web development or sort of tech perspective. I am not a web developer nor am I a web accessibility expert. However, I can tell you what I've been learning about those things and what applies to, to the work that we do for nonprofit organizations. And the last thing is, it's interesting. A lot of people start by asking, what's your favorite checklist? Do you have a list? Do you have a, a checker? We don't, at LCL, we don't tend to embrace accessibility as a checking off the box. We really consider building it into our strategy into the philosophy and the, the, the mandate of what we're doing. I'll just get for a quick raise of hands. Has anyone heard of IDEA before? You might have heard of DEI. So DEI or EDI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. If you've also heard of IDEA, this is another acronym you could maybe think about instead of the checklist concept that we use inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility as the basis and the foundation of all we do. And yes, and there's lots of different uh, varieties. I see a couple of people see, use IDEA. Any combination of those letters is it great. It's a wonderful way to, to build that in from the beginning. So that's going to be one of our concepts today. All right. I promised you 10 things. So number one is it's possible and it's desirable to boost accessibility and all of your online learning formats. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit about uh, in-person as well. So it doesn't matter how you're delivering uh, learning, training, workshops, conferences, et cetera, you can boost your accessibility in all of them. So I'm going to ask two quick questions here. And uh, I'm just curious, if you, if your organization offers training and learning at this point in time. Can you tell me a bit more about the, the format? Like, how do you deliver it? What type of learning? So I'm just going to list a couple of them. Uh, do you have e-learning? Are your learners doing asynchronous or self-directed courses? Uh, do you have blended? Are they taking a combination of maybe in-person or instructor-led and some of, of the self-directed on their own? There's hybrid. There's virtual sessions, there's facilitated learning online. There's all sorts of ways to call it, but I'm just curious if you can share. We have a few people who are saying virtual, and that can mean lots of things too. So is it virtual facilitated? Is it self-directed? Are people taking e-learning? That will give us some context. I want us to just brainstorm all the different varieties of ways that learning is offered in these times, right? Thanks, Eli, you're ch chiming in as well. Whether you've got workshops, whether you, they are posted virtually or in person, whether you've got online courses that are taken self-directed 
like an asynchronous session or if they're synchronous, maybe they're hosted virtually. It doesn't matter. All of these formats and deliveries can increase their level of accessibility and you can increase the reach of these as well. And I'd like to just ask out there, this is a big question, but who's your learner audience? Are we talking mostly volunteers, internal staff? Are we talking with members of the public? Again, any of these learning audiences, whether you have people with disability or not, can benefit from some of these formats. The first takeaway is you definitely want to think about ways you can boost accessibility in any type of learning deliverable you have. Great. We see lots of people still, they're still answering in the chat. We've got in-person trainings, volunteers and staff. Excellent. That's wonderful. All right. So I'm just going to use virtual instructor-led training or VILT, as we call in our team, as, a, as just an example and starting point. So lots of you are offering virtual instructor-led, maybe through Zoom, maybe through other sessions, sorry, other platforms. And so this is a great example of ways that you can Im improve the level of accessibility. So for example, maybe helping your facilitators or instructors use some of the functionality in your platform. Are you using closed captions? Are you using transcripts? Are you describing the slides as you show them? Do you have alt text in your slides? Those kind of things. And are you embracing ways to provide more accessibility in your handouts or in how you engage people in the session itself. So there's ways you, you can increase online learning, be it with people in a facilitated situation or not. And the next thing we're going to do is get a little bit more familiar with the terminology. I'm going to get a little bit technical for a second. So some of you may have heard some of these terms already, and if not, that's okay. We're, we're going to go through some of them, but the next step is to get familiar with some of the web terms. And I'm just curious, do any of you use any assistive technology in your organization? And so by assistive technology, any sort of platform, software system, it can be hardware as well, that may support people who require technical assistance to adapt or accommodate in terms of their digital experience. So here are some examples of assistive technologies. People who have vision loss often need to use a screen reader. So it's a common one is JAWS. Another one is NVDA. Uh, NVDA is a free one, by the way. And uh, if you're using Microsoft, it also has a built-in screen reader called Narrator. So I'm just curious, is anyone using assistive technology in your organization? All right. Nobody has their hand up. So that's okay. That's, that's fine. Does anyone know of their learner audience who might need to use this? And if you're not sure, then that's a good place to start, right? So we're going to talk about users of assistive technology today, but in some cases, it might be someone who has a permanent or maybe a, a, um, a temporary disability. So I'll give it another example. Um, someone who might be using keyboard only navigation because they're having some mobility issues with their wrist. And then, so have, using a mouse is, is really challenging. So they might be using keyboard shortcuts only. Or someone who um, does not have the use of their arms might be using a sip and puff a sort of cursor to move forward through the content. So that's another um, example of assistive technology. And uh, CART is an example of um, assistive technology that we're probably using right now, or if you're using uh, Zoom or other sort of platforms, uh, you can also have um, direct translation or transcription, I should say, and closed captioning of, of your, your media. Yeah, thanks for participating there, Eli. That's great. And yeah, accessibility is helpful for people who have um, who may be born with disability or who have a temporary disability. And at some point in time, all of us are likely to experience some type of disability. For example, my vision is going down these days and I'm finding it really helpful to zoom quite big into the content, into the font size. And so that's how I'm using it. And that means that I should be able to read the screen as big as I need to, right? Lastly, I'm going to use the term WCAG or WCAG. Has anyone heard of this before? Feel free to put your hand up. These are based on the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. You can go and visit these at w3.org. 
this is basically what we use in online learning to increase the level of access to online courses. And so we're really basing this off of website development and web accessibility. And so it's taking us a little bit of time to translate that. And it's not always a direct correlation. And so that's why I said we don't really use checklists. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, but happy to share more. And thank you, Eli, for adding more links in the chat. But you might hear me say WCAG. You might hear me say some numbers. You might hear me say A, AA, or AAA. And what you need to know is that these are levels of accessibility. And it's okay for an organization to have certain levels of accessibility for certain experiences, products, programs, you name it, but that different levels may provide different access points or barrier points. For example, AAA is when you may have a video that everybody can access and experience. For example, someone who is experiencing vision loss, they can hear it. If someone has a hearing disability, they can see it or read it. For those who speak or use American Sign Language, ASL, they might also see some sign language. There might be different ways to also engage with the videos. That is an example of, of what AAA is and how that relates to online learning can vary quite widely. At the moment, we're using AA as our standard. And what that means is that it works for most of the time with people who use assistive technology. And that's really what I would recommend that we focus on today is that double A standard. So that's number three yeah, in terms of our uh, takeover for nonprofits. It's know the laws. And of course, not only do you want to align, but it would be ideal to go above and beyond. The laws are really what's bare, barely the minimum, but do know what is legislated for your province. And so Today, we've got people from Ontario. We have people from British Columbia. It's fascinating because across Canada, we have had different journeys in terms of accessibility, how the government is supporting it or enforcing it or legislating it. So I'm not going to give you an exhaustive history today, but I'm really excited by what's happening in our country. And Ontario is leading the way in terms of the AODA Act, or the Act Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, I should say. And then what's exciting is in British Columbia since 2021 and today in 2024, we now have the Accessible BC Act. What is the bare minimum that we need to do and, 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 and share? And that's very similar to our website accessibility. So if you're not sure, no matter where you're from, look up your, your province or your territory's level of accessibility for websites, and that will be the same for online learning. And how to interpret that and how to make that actionable and operational in your organization is that's the role that consultants like myself and my group play. Happy to support you there. And we're all still trying to figure it out as well. And so what I'd like you to do is number four, consider prioritizing different levels of accessibility. So a great way to get started is to focus on what is the best, what are the most uh, impactful experiences that you want to increase or offer as more accessible. And uh, you don't have to do all of them at once. You may want to consider, again, which level of accessibility for different products makes the most sense. And so here's what we do in, in our learning world. And again, you're going to recognize the same sort of terms. We have A, AA, AAA. In order for us to, to deliver AA or WCAG 2.0, one learning, we often will use a combination of uh, delivery methods that could be developed in a product like Articulate Storyline or other products like that. We're going to be considering for keyboard shortcuts. We might also use your LMS to do some testing as well as if we're doing videos, then we will have things like closed captions and transcripts and if we're doing AAA, we would also include described video. So these are just some examples of how a learning product can be ad adapted or modified to meet different levels of accessibility. It is a journey that a lot of nonprofits are on. And so I'd just love to do a quick check-in here. A lot of nonprofits may have a standard across the board, or maybe they're just embracing a few projects at a time that are different levels of accessibility. but who here is currently working towards making their learning more accessible at this point in time? And if you're not sure, that's okay too. You can also say that. 
I think I saw some comments and questions in the chat. And Eli, is there anyone that any question that you want to point out right now? Sure. We've got two cool. questions in the queue right now. Oh, great. So the first one came from Alyssa, who was saying, are you able to recommend any plain language courses just with that particular kind of accessibility? Yes, I definitely can. We'll talk about plain language when we get into sort of the universal design principles and a few tips. But there are some certificates you can take now that are focused on getting better at plain language. And just for those of you who are new to the term plain language, it is a way to make your writing and your the, the words we use in, in our content to be more accessible. And what that means is usually a like writing at a language level uh, anywhere between, I've seen grade six to grade eight or nine. And I'm going to come back to that one because I don't want to cite the wrong course, but I may have to get back to this person by email. I, for some reason, the name of the courses I recommended are, are escaping. But yes, we, that's no a great worries one. at all. And yeah, yeah we have some of those key links. We can even include them in the emails that come out later. We have one more question that came from Jennifer, and I think is also going to emerge through the course of this webinar today. And Jennifer says, I think this may come up in the presentation. But what resources are available to an organization as they work towards that WCAG 2.1? Yeah, great question. I'm going to give you some right now, but the resources I'm going to share are some of them low cost and some of them are free. Accessibility, checking software and tools that we can use. Just a really quick one that I've got lots of free webinars as well. You're welcome to take a look at and There's even more resources there, but I'm seeing a lot of nonprofit share and, and TechSoup is a great resource as well in terms of these types of, of events, shall we say. So I know that was really broad, but I'm going to keep going with the presentation and we'll get to that question too. So thanks. I usually try to stop like halfway through just to make sure I'm answering questions. So that was really helpful. Thanks, Eli. Okay. So I'll, number five is one of these tips that you can take away and that it's applying universal design to how you approach all your work. What is universal design? It is based on four principles and I love a good acronym. So if you can think of the acronym POUR, P-O-U-R, this will help you consider ways to build, build in more accessibility. And I'm going to share some of the questions that we would ask our own team and our own clients in terms of how we make this work. P stands for perceivable. And by the way, there's a lot of content and some great resources on the w3.org. Okay, web accessibility website. You're welcome to take a look at that as well. But perceivable means is the content, is the, the information presented in ways that, that the learners can actually perceive. That might mean that they can engage with the content. Is it, is, for example, are the colors that you use, are they high contrast enough? It might be a very nice poster, but if no one can read it, then it's not being affected, right? Same thing with an online course. Are things perceivable? Does Are people able to experience and actually access the information? The second one is operable. Operable is very much about the online accessibility of websites. Do the things actually work, right? Can somebody actually open up the link or can they access and get through? Can they proceed through an online learning course? It doesn't work for everybody, right? Does it operate? And a U is, is for understandable. And what that means is for our team, we really try to take a look at, have we optimized the experience for everybody, for the neurotypical and the neurodiverse? So for us, that really helps us question our content and how it's written. And I love that someone called out plain language resources. That's fantastic. So a question we would ask ourselves are, are these key messages of the course, are they coming across clearly? Are they, are they written in a way that is lowering barriers and increasing access, right? And then lastly, and this is the most open to interpretation, it's robust. Robust in a web or development IT kind of background means, are we leveraging the technology in the best way possible to support their experience or their use, like the user experience, right? And so what we, t we, what we do in learning is we take that and we say, are learners able to drive their own experience? Are they able to take the time they need, action what they need, when they need it? And so an example of this is we don't use any timed interactions or we don't force the learner to do things in a certain order. We want to make it open 
in the sense that the learner knows how best that they may need to support themselves for that experience. So we try to give a lot of options and choice. And I just want you to continue thinking of these things as we go through a couple examples. An example of perceivable fonts, colors. Brands are shifting towards being more high contrast. So perceivable could be, are people able to actually read the content? And obviously in this case, this example is for people who have uh, vision, but you know, which slide is easier to read? <laughs> the one with a higher color contrast is going to be easier, right? Also think about your font. How simple is it to, to read your fonts? Can you determine between numbers versus less? Those are all things to consider. And that's an example of perceivable. Another one is using images. This is a slide with no images. If I was going to give you a copy of my slides, I would make sure to add alt text. And alt text is a way for people who use assistive technology screen readers to maybe give them the context of the image. And there is some good ways to describe alt text and bad. So here's an image. I've got an example of a grizzly bear. Now, if I was writing a course about grizzly bears, I would want to be really specific about how I describe the image, right? Uh, if it's just decorative, I may just keep it shorter. And again, the context of the image is really important. So I'm just curious here, is anyone using alt text in any of their website or online learning? And do you have any of these challenges in terms of learning how to write what the alt text should be? We work with a lot of people with disability who have shared with us that alt text is really all over the board. What's really nice, and you've probably noticed this on LinkedIn, is people are starting to put more alt text describing the images. And there is a sweet spot. I've used a bear here because I like the analogy of, of uh, Goldilocks and the three bears. But just think about what is the just right level. Uh, it's great to have alt text. You don't always have to have super detailed alt text. It needs to support the learning, right? So if it's, if it's too long, it's going to be overwhelming and cognitively overloading. If it's too short, we're not giving enough context. And so just finding that just right level of description of your images is really important. Another uh, example that we already talked about is Video. What level of accessibility do you want to provide your videos? I don't know about you folks, but I love watching video with the closed captions. And it's nice to see that on TikTok or Facebook and all sorts of the reels nowadays is that people are putting in not just the transcripts and the closed captions, but they're hard baking that into the, everyone's experience. So that's a great example of universal design. If you want AAA or if you're curious what the difference is, Fully accessible videos will have things like an ASL interpreter as well as a transcript that people can use and closed captions, of course. We're seeing a lot of amazing things with AI these days so that we can make our videos more accessible and share them more freely with everybody. So another example of op opera, how does the course actually work? So this is an example of e-learning. And what we do is we make sure that our um, e-learning users and testers can, can navigate through the entire experience uh, using the assistive technology of their choice. So we test it with different products and different software. Uh, we might be using specific e-learning design and development software like Storyline or, or others with that intention. You'll see here then my first bullet that I've put we often combine an e-learning development tool with your LMS because, of course, to be accessible, it needs to also, it needs to be built accessibly, but also it needs to be shared on an accessible platform. And I'm just curious here, who is using an LMS at your organization? And for those who are new with that term, LMS means learning management system. So if you've ever taken an online course with a university or a college, they are delivering that experience through a learning management system. So one example for is you may not see any drag and drop or matching. Anything that has to grab and hover and pull something across the screen is not going to be accessible. And so there's other ways to build that type of content that is still interactive, that the learner can drive, and that gives the learner options in terms of how they access the information. And yeah, thanks for your question, Ben. A CMS, well, 
An LMS is a learning platform that, that hosts e-learning. E-learning file is often developed in SCORN, and it's different than a content management system or a constituent relationship management system in that it also tracks and um, it can give you more reporting in terms of who, who has taken the learning, what have they consumed, or, or if there's any like, grades associated. So an LMS is often much more associated with delivering hosting, tracking, and reporting on learning experiences. A little bit different than a CMS, but great question. Yeah, accessible online learning will not have timed activities that would not be operable or robust. And uh, we allow free navigation so people can go back, they can look at something more than once. And I recommend avoiding some full narration. There, a lot of studies are showing that learners prefer to consume learning content in various modalities. And so allowing choice is really important. And uh, we'll just go through a couple more. Use for understandable. And thank you to the person who asked the question about play language. That was really great. So there are two resources we use a lot, and that is our team is all uh, improving and, and constantly developing our skills in plain language. And I'm glad you brought up the question of accessibility, sorry, plain language certificates and courses. We use two checkers. One is Flesh Kincaid and one is the Hemingway app. These two, uh, they're free online tools that allow us to just check any sort of content we've written and make sure that we're not using sentences that are too long or if they're where you're using two technical terms or that, that kind of thing. Uh, another thing is um, using AI to help us reword, rewrite, and um, make make something more plain language. Um, there's lots of new new um, approaches that way. We also want to consider writing content for the broadest understanding. For example, anything that helps people who are English, English language learners or people who uh, maybe have learning disability or maybe who are just busy. I don't know about you folks, but I know that I appreciate seeing bullets or white space on the page. Mm -hmm. These are all things that are going to help everybody with uh, context and understanding. And another way that we approach something that's understandable is supplying good learning science. What are the adult education principles that we might use is uh, making connections with any prior knowledge. We want to definitely be designing for behavior change. And what that means is we have to be building in practice opportunities and applying all of the principles of neuroscience to how adults live and work and learn as we do in our jobs, in our volunteer time, and you name it. So this is something that instructional designers and, and groups like ourselves could help you with. If you do have instructional designers in your own teams, then do lead on them. We always want to have measurable learning and make sure that we're making the right impact. And lastly is robust. And I'm going to give you two examples of, of things that are robust, but I highly recommend you, you visit the inclusive website, which is called the inclusiveworkplace.ca. It's in French and English. It's one of the client projects we've been working on. And what we, what we did actually is during the pandemic, they had lots of funding to support people who have disability or people on the spectrum to find and maintain meaningful work and these are our employment tools what we actually did is instead of putting all of their learning experiences in an lms we did as we started publishing some of our e-learning to html and what that means is that these are ungated open access experiences anyone can use one thing for nonprofit profits is you might want to consider ways that you can ungate your learning. What that means is you might have to think about and be a little bit more creative in terms of how are you providing and which platforms are you using to publish your learning. Uh, again, those of you who have LMSs, you probably, I'm going to guess, have some a limit to the number of people or users that could be in your system. And another way to consider and boost your accessibility at your organization is to choose wisely. So choose technology that is accessible. And all of your technology should and can provide this. It's a question of us asking and insisting that it be accessible. So got a very small picture here, a couple of different LMSs out there. 
Brutal, or you name it. There's D2L. There's a bunch of different, excuse me, tools you can use to deliver online learning. But uh, not all uh, technology is going to be WCAG 2.1. So really what I've discovered and what our clients have, I've also seen is make sure you work with your vendors to make sure that you're using their accessibility fun uh, functions. And also remember that whatever you put into it needs to also be accessible. So just like a website, whether you're using WordPress or other tools like Drupal, it's how you use it, what you put into it. There's a lot of the human element that's still there, right? And I'm going to quickly go through three more points. How are we doing for time? We've got a few more minutes. But I'd love to, to just acknowledge that nonprofits are doing something super well, way better than anyone in, in the private sector, and that's engaging community. All of us as, uh, working with nonprofits are already doing a great job of working with the people that you want to serve, your constituents, right? So what that means in online learning for you is that you can leverage asking for real stories. You can work with people who will test your content. And here are some examples of some of the videos that we've been creating with, with our client at Inclusion Canada. And um, uh, you'll see that we have stories, we have features, we've got panelists. We work with the communities that we want to serve. And in, in some cases, we've even included them as part of our SMEs or subject matter experts on courses. Here are a couple of ways that we work with members of the community is we might ask for real life humans to, to test our courses. And we might be in a, a template or maybe in different rounds of review, but we definitely want to conduct live accessibility testing with actual people and not just use the computers to check it. So that comes back to my statement earlier, which is we don't just use a checklist. We actually want to make sure that it's meeting the needs of people in the community that, that we're trying to serve, right? Another thing is we work with people with living experience. And so uh, I know that's something that nonprofits do really well. And I would just say, continue doing that. So ask for feedback, both in terms of your content or your drafts, as well as in the technology that you'll be delivering it in. And also make sure you're asking for their perspective. You will have a much better engagement and, and buy-in as well if, if you've engaged with the community from the beginning. Great. Uh, we've got a few more questions and I see uh, there's some nice questions too about LMS um, in the chat. So I'll get to your question in a second. But um, another way to, to boost accessibility is to build it into your project management. If you don't apply a project management framework, um, you can also think of it in terms of how you program some of your activities. But here's how we approach um, building accessibility in. And you'll see it's really at the base. Like it is the foundation. We want to make sure that it's woven throughout all stages of a project. And what you're seeing here are some of the steps that we would use for an e-learning development project, talking about the scope and then how are we going to measure all the way down to designing the content and building a prototype. And then how do we publish it? There's always going to be elements of that universal design built in. So you might want to embrace that and make sure it's built in from the beginning of your organization. And here are some ways that you can use, I don't know if you've heard of the, the golden triangle or the, the triangle of project management, which is to get a high quality deliverable or project, you'll have to make some decisions based on the cost, the scope, and the time of the project. But it, it is absolutely doable to increase accessibility and you can use the acronym POR to help you with that. For example, for P, like how can we test that it's perceivable? When will we do it? Who will test it? Uh, is a great question to ask for any project when you are planning it out or when you're managing a project and, and as you coordinate the work, right? Another example with O is, you know, does it actually work? Is it operable? Who's going to test it for us? What do we do if the technology doesn't work, right? So thinking through that in the project management framework is really helpful as well. I'll let you consider how you might use understandable and robust. But one way for us is we always like to build in a little bit more time to the project because anytime you include a community or people's lived experience, you want to allow for that time to, for them to give the feedback. So that's my tip for you is definitely include some more time in your project, especially if you're new at building online learning 
uh, products that are accessible. And all right, we're getting to the question about some tools. I'm going to um, answer uh, Rachel's question about LMS. There's lots of to uh, LMS that are uh, we came 2.1 nowadays and are moving towards 2.2. Uh, some in Canada and lots in the United States as well. But here are a couple tools that we use. Uh, a lot of these are uh, low cost. Some of them are free. Some of them are paid. We mentioned the Hemingway editor earlier. The Wave Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool is a really great checker. You can download that for free. And there are two really good Canadian companies. Grackle Docs is a it's a nice accessibility tool. It's a Google Chrome extension. For example, any Google document that we have in our uh, Google workspace, we can apply um, the Grackle Docs plugin and make sure it's accessible. So we create a lot of uh, PDF UA or uh, universally accessible PDFs in that way. Uh, when we do slides, when we do um, documents, we can also check them ourselves and make sure that they've been accessible. We also sometimes work with Able Docs. So there's lots of good tools out there. And it's really amazing organizations like Fable who are using people with disability to be the digital developers and testers of digital products and pro projects and products. So if, if, uh, if you have any other questions about different tools you can use, let me know. If you're, you're a Microsoft group, then Microsoft has lots of free accessibility checkers as well. And if you are a Google Workspace user, then there's, there's other free tools. And thank you so much, Eli, for adding some of those into the chat. I appreciate that. Yeah. What I would do is um, there, there are lots of LMSs. I'm just trying to answer, Rachel, your question. Very adaptable. So which LMSs have I found that are very adaptable and meet all most of the cornerstones of accessibility? There's quite a long list of those, but again, it's going to depend what you put into it. A lot of the LMSs such as I use Learn Upon, we're working with Duchebo, they, they will be accessible if you've optimized it that way. Again, it's really, it's, it depends how you've implemented it. And that's, again, something we could talk about more specifically. I'd be happy to help you with that. The list is quite long, so I don't want to get into it here. But again, lots of LMSs can be used with different levels of accessibility in mind, right? And so last, my last tip for everybody today is make sure accessibility is part of your philosophy, the ground rules, your strategic plan, Maybe this is a good takeaway for all of you to go back and ask, does our organization have an accessibility statement or purpose? How are we building this into our workflows? But more importantly, how, like how is this a part of our organization's philosophy? And in the beginning, I shared our accessibility statement. We, we want to use these, these concepts to inform our work. And so if, if this inspires you, you're welcome to revisit that with your group. And I'm just going to reread the first line, which is that LCL, we're really committed to helping organizations like yours. We want to remove the barriers to online learning and we want to increase access. And so we try our best to design an experience that's, that's optimized for everyone. And so we really do use those concepts of universal design to do that. And so I'll quickly the summarize the takeaways, but more important is what can you do with them? So I'd love to open it up to everybody. We looked really quickly at a whole whack of concept. What I am curious about is, do you have anything you can action right away? Or maybe things that you'll take back to your organization and maybe ask about or investigate. So we talked a little bit about the following things. So we talked about looking at increasing or boosting accessibility in any shape or form of, of your learning and training deliveries. And that can mean everything from asynchronous to synchronous. There are ways to boost that. And number two is just getting it familiar with terms of web accessibility, the different, um, di different requirements and what those mean, and getting familiar and aligning with the accessibility legislation in your province. Also considering the level that you will prioritize. I don't think it's necessary and nor is it practical to aim for triple A in everything that you do, but you may want to consider increasing the accessibility of your videos first, or perhaps of certain programs that you're offering first before others. And maybe you take them from level A to double A. So make it practical and, and relevant for your organization. 
Uh, number five, we spent a lot of time on because there's four things about universal design that you can remember easily using the POUR acronym, P-O-U-R. And I hope you can remember those perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Uh, number six is no matter which vendor you're using or what products you're using, make sure that you're asking, hey, how is this accessible? How do we turn on those accessible function tools or parameters or settings? Maybe it's about changing those tools or leveraging the ones you have in better ways, right? Number seven is continue engaging your community. Do not work uh, without real life humans to give you input and feedback and, and also help you test and help you um, improve your levels of access to everyone that you're serving. And number eight, hopefully we've inspired you to build accessibility into the framework of your projects and think about how that can be the foundation of the work you're doing. And then it will carry forward through the rest of the project. And you can lean on free and low cost accessibility tools. We gave you a few examples today. Our team uses the way webbing tool quite a bit. And lastly is consider how you can add accessibility to your strategic plan and, and, and in particular your educational mandate. So I'm just curious if anyone's brave enough to mention anything that they're going to take away in terms of actions. And I'm, I'm not, I'm also going to pause here for a quick minute, just answered all the questions in the chat. So Eli can help me out as well. So if I wanted to contact you, should I send to you an email to schedule a call? What's the best way to make that happen? Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. You're welcome to visit our website, leochanglearning.com. We're always getting requests. So drop us an email or you can fill out our forum. Tell us a little bit more about what we can help with or what you're curious about. Uh, and if we aren't able to, we can definitely put you in touch with other services, resources that you can use. For us, it's really about building the capacity across nonprofits to really make this more broadly embraced, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> like everyone can do this and we'd like to lower the barriers for you as well. So give us a call, send us an email. Be happy to hear from you. Awesome. Yeah. Then thank you all for joining us here for lunch today. And Delia and team, really grateful for you to come back as a repeat presenter and, and go deeper into this particular aspect of learning management programs and systems.